Well, when I was a little kid, I used to write stories all the time. Uh, my friends were more athletic than I was, but I was very good at writing uh, short stories ever since I was in public school. And uh, I had some teachers at that level who encouraged me a great deal. Uh, last year, I donated all of my personal and professional archives to McMaster University. And in amongst them were uh, stories that I'd written when I was seven years old, eight years old. Um, and they were always, even back then, science fiction stories. It's what I've loved my whole life. And I was very lucky that along the way, instead of, as sometimes happens, people discourage people, you know, and say, oh, don't write that, or, you know. I had some very nice mentors and some very supportive teachers along the way. I always, when I teach writing, tell people the best thing to do is to plan it out in advance and know where you're going. And obviously for some kinds of fiction, like mystery fiction, you have to know who did it before you start writing or you, you know, you're just floundering. Um, but I'm better at preaching that than I'm actually at practicing that. I always find that I discover the most interesting stuff in the process of writing and spending time with the characters and uh, working out the very fine details of the plot that are impossible to work out until you actually get to that point in the story. So I do believe that a lot of research is necessary. Whatever it is you're writing about, whatever place, whatever topic you're writing about, you should know absolutely intimately before you write the first word. But it is a journey of discovery as you go through the story to find what it is that you want to say. Well, I'm a full-time writer. I've been lucky enough to be a full-time writer now for 30 years. And so I do it every day. And then when I say every day, I do it every day. I, I work seven days a week. I may work a little less on the weekends than during the week. But my experience is that if you take a break from your writing project, you're juggling so many balls intellectually. You're trying to keep track of so many characters, so many thoughts, so many ideas. And if you let it go for even 24, let alone 48, 72 hours, you'll drop those balls and you'll spend the next day just getting caught back up. So when I'm actually doing a draft of a novel, I try to get 2,000 words done a day, which is about eight manuscript pages, which is quite a substantial amount, but I've been at it for 30 years. I should be good and efficient by this point. Uh, a more junior writer, somebody beginning, if they manage even one good manuscript a page a day, they should be very proud of themselves. Well, there's no question that within the science fiction field, I was most heavily influenced by Arthur C. Clarke, best known for uh, the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, his best known novel is Childhood's End, and uh, by Frederick Pohl, P-O-H-L, an American uh, science fiction writer. And I, in my later years, I got to know Pohl um, and became friendly with him, which was a great, great experience. He passed away last year, very sadly. Um, I never met Clarke. Uh, but uh, uh, was enormously inspired by him. He was the first writer I encountered who really had a grounding in hard science and rationality, but wasn't afraid to nonetheless tackle metaphysical issues. And that certainly permeated my work, his influence. Well, you know, um, uh, Stephen Hawking had an uh, op-ed in the New York Times just this past week saying we have to be careful about artificial intelligence. You want to be vigilant about something that might be such a sea change in the human condition. No question about that. However, very difficult for human beings to understand why it is that human beings behave the way we do. We are very violent, very competitive, uh, very um, rapacious as a species. And that's the legacy of the savanna. That's Darwinian programming. Uh, survival of the fittest is really survival of the nastiest. It's me benefiting myself and my progeny at the expense of you and your progeny. Survival of the fittest is who has the most kids who survived to pass on the genes the next generation wins. And it presupposes an economy of scarcity where there isn't enough to go around. So I have to take from you to advantage me. An artificial intelligence will bubble up into existence in a world of absolute infinite bounty. The fact that it wants to look at a document doesn't mean that you can't also be looking at it 
endless numbers of copies of anything anybody might want. Uh, memory and storage capacity uh, you know, are asymptotically approaching zero in cost. No matter how much memory you want, it's dirt cheap to get it and it's just going to be more that way, not less. So what are they competing for? What would drive them to even think in terms of conquest and, and uh, securing to themselves things that others can't have. It's not the crucible that they would have formed in. They didn't form in uh, nature, red and tooth and claw on the African savanna. They formed it in, a, in a, an environment of egalitarianism where what they see from us is our best, not our worst, where we created Wikipedia and help other guys out with computing problems and answer questions about antiquing for some guy in New South Wales who has no, you know, any local expert to ask. Uh, I think there's a real possibility that it will be a win-win synergistic relationship between us and AI. People are extremely receptive. Canadians are extremely receptive. And, but when I was starting out, when I started writing fiction in the 80s, every Canadian author I spoke to said, don't set your stuff in Canada. You'll never sell internationally. Uh, it, you know, set it in the States, set it in Boston or Chicago or you know, something like that. And it was the received wisdom. Everybody was saying that. And I kept looking around for the guy on Young Street with the tin cup begging because he had set a novel in Canada and gone broke doing that. Nobody, as far as I could tell, had tested that proposition in the areas of science fiction or fantasy. Very few had tested it in the area of mystery fiction. And I thought, you know what? I'm part of the first generation of novelists to do all of their books with a word processor, not a typewriter. If somebody tells me in New York that all those references to Toronto have to be changed to Chicago. It's 10 seconds work to change the city name, right? Uh, and in 30 years of publishing and 22 years a novelist now, and 22 novels under my belt, not 24 years a novelist, no American editor, agent, bookseller, critic, or reader has ever said a single negative word about the flagrant Canadian content in my work. And Canadians have come to embrace it a great deal. It is symptomatic of us as a people, though, that we even ask this question. There's not a writer uh, or an interviewer in the States who would ever go up to, say, Robert B. Parker, the mystery writer who writes novels set in Boston where he lives and says, what are you doing setting all that stuff in the back bay? Nobody's going to know, you know, that Mass Avenue is a street and, oh my God, Harvard? Who's ever heard of that, right? Nobody says that. But we as Canadians think that somehow we have to disguise our identity. And as I drove up Young Street to get, get here, of course, I went by all these great Canadian restaurants with names like New York Fries, which is a Canadian chain, and Boston Pizza, which is a Canadian chain, and Montana's, which is a Canadian chain, and Swiss Sa Chalet, which is a Canadian chain. Where can you find you know, um, the Muskoka Grill and the Manitoba Fries and all? You can't. We hide who we are, part of our national identity is that we have a national secret identity that we don't want anybody to find out about. And I decided I was tired of being Kal-El, I was tired of being Clark Kent, I was going to be Superman and loud and proud say this is who I am.